uh, Dr. Tavano is going to be talking to us about fishing for the giant buzzsaw shark. Take it away. Thank you so much. So we're at a dino fest, and we are not going to talk about a dino. What is going on? All right, but this is a pretty wild and wonderful animal on its own right. It predates dinosaurs by quite a lot, actually. And uh, you can see in this, in this picture, this spiral with uh, pointy surfaces on it is one of the most famous fossil mysteries that's been around for over 100 years. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it as we try fishing in our ancient seas to try to understand more about this animal. If you go way back, you got to go way back during the Permian time period, this is what our world looked like. Okay, so a lot of you have probably heard of the term Pangaea, the idea that all of our continents were hugging each other together and they're surrounded by a large ocean. Well, Utah, right here in Salt Lake City, is where that arrow is pointed on the west coast before Oregon and Washington and California cluttered up our coastline. And uh, my town of Pocatello is about two hours drive north, and it's right where that little indentation, if I find my pointer, right there, that little bay cutting in, right there, is Pocatello. And we're located in this embayment where uh, some, a really interesting seaway, the Phosphoria Sea, accumulated sediments that now today, for the last hundred years, have been the source of mining for phosphate-rich rocks. And we turn that phosphate into fertilizer that gets dumped in Iowa to make corn so that you can eat, right? That's what we do with it. But at that same time, this animal that I'm about to show you lived and eventually died and was buried in the same rocks that the miners dig up. And because the mines are there, we have a lot of these fossils that have come out of the ground over the last century, right here in Idaho and in northern Utah. If you go back in time, if you had your scuba gear, scuba gear on in the Permian and you were swimming around, you might see a seascape that looks like this. At first glance, it looks kind of similar to something you might swim around today. Uh, until you look closer at some of the animals that are maybe a little more exotic to you, like uh, some crinoids are sitting up here. We've got some corals and sponges, which are things we have today. We have some nautiloids, swimming uh, squiddy kinds of things. And then, uh-oh, there's somebody terrible lurking above you, right? Oh, what is it? So, this is one of the fossils that you can find in a mine. In fact, one of the miners in southeast Idaho sent me this photograph. Of, of the fossil. This is a fossil that has been found for uh, around the world from Australia, China, of course here Idaho and Utah. It's found in, uh, in Alaska, up in Norway, all over the world. Um, and it always looks the same. You can see what it looks like. It's a spiral. And if you start at the middle of the spiral, you'll see little triangles. And if you follow around the spiral, the little triangles get to be bigger triangles until you get to the outermost spiral. And you can see big triangles coming up here. Forever, when the first people, that uh, first paleontologists that looked at this fossil, they looked at those triangles. They looked at them very closely under a microscope and said, those are indistinguishable from shark teeth. Those are shark teeth, and this is a shark fossil but I have no idea what else to do with it. Because <laughs> there are no sharks that have a spiral of teeth like this today. And uh, it's, it's a weirdo. OK, so what do you do with this? How many loops do you count? From here, I go around one, I go around two, I go around three, maybe three and a half. Some of these get up to four loops. And the teeth always get small in the middle and grow incrementally larger as you go to the outside of the band. What a weird, weird, wonderful fossil. Well, you can see one of these downstairs. Our museum here has a really beautiful, one of the largest specimens in the world, actually, downstairs. And I, I understand it's on view right now, so you can see it. And it also, again, it follows the rules, right? It's a, a spiral that loops maybe this one about three, four times. And you can see the triangles build as you get to the outside. We've seen a lot of these around the world. And we've done a lot of work on this, this particular animal. Uh, we think we can tell three different types of helicoprion, the name of the animal. Helicoprion means helical, spiral. Prion is Latin for saw. 
So the Russian who named this back in 1899 recognized that it kind of looks like a circular saw blade that you would cut wood with, right? Again, can you think of any animals that have a saw blade that's a spinning saw in their head? Tyler. <laughs> Maybe. But what are they? What are we going to do with this beastie? In fact, we have 8 million years worth of time that we can find this fossil. So it wasn't a shot in the dark one-off. We have lots of them, and they extended for a good 8 million years on this Earth. There are so many wonderful ideas that people have put forward. In the sciences, we call these wonderful ideas hypotheses, right? These are ideas that try to explain uh, an observation and put them into general context. So you'll notice that our spiral is all over the place on this animal, right? These are all legitimate published versions, except the pizza cutter. That's probably not as serious. Uh, I like the pizza cutter idea. But we have the, the one sticking outside the nose on the front. We have the, uh, the one sticking down below, like a party favor. It can whip it out at you. Come on, come on. That'd be cool. We have one located in the lower jaw. We have one heck not even on the jaw, it's on the spine. It spines on the dorsal fin, which is a thing that we find. Teeth and sharks and scales are awfully similar when you look at them in detail. And there are many sharks and fish that have spines to keep other people from eating them, right? They put big bony spines right on the dorsal fin. So maybe it was there. Heck, maybe it was on the tail fin. Or maybe it is in the mouth, but they have two on each side and two on the top. Who knows, right? What's missing is we don't have fossil evidence to put that spiral along with more of the animal, right? Until, aha, we do. So it turns out, uh, I had a student, here's, a, here's my student Jesse from a number of years ago, an undergraduate student who's, who wanted to work in the museum. We put him down in the basement and he said, hey, go find a problem. And he found a problem. He found our collection of Hilda Prime, which at the time numbered about 50 or 60. Largest collection in the world. I didn't even know it was in the basement. Right? Good, good student. Good student to have. And he had to start asking all the, the annoying questions, like, did it, did it whip out? Did it, why did it spiral? Did it die and then coil up? Right? He started asking all these questions, and eventually that led us to figuring out that actually nobody knew any of the answers. Right? <laughs> At least of all his professors. And so we found this specimen on the, on, on the shelves in the basement, and it turns out it's got a little bit more than just the spiral. It turns out this is a specimen called Idaho Number no. 4. It's one of 13 of the Idaho Numbers series that were collected in 30 minutes during a lunch break by a paleontologist who wasn't even studying this animal. He was after little squiddy things. And so during the, I talked to this guy, an old timer, and he said he just kept popping rocks open and it was one after another, after another, after another. This is Idaho number four in color. And if you scan it and take the color off, it helps you see these flat panels there. There's a flat panel here. There's a little, it looks like a button over here on this front end. And on this side, here's that panel, here's the lower panel, here's a little button on the front end. That is the upper jaw right there in cartilage. What do you know about sharks? Sharks are made of cartilage, not bone. Teeth preserve really well, cartilage does not. But some sharks add a little mineral to their, to their jaw bones because you can imagine the jaws have a fair amount of stress on them. So that can preserve, and we do have jaws preserved. So how do we look into the rock? We use a CAT scanner, just like a medical CAT scanner if you went to the hospital. We can use the density contrast of your flesh and your bones to actually see inside you. We do the same thing with rocks. We put a rock in a CAT scan, we shoot it full of energy, and then we'll see the contrast in density. Let me show you a quick little video. Let's see, it'll start. What we're going to do is scan through this specimen. I think we're going from left to right, and you're going to see a vertical sections, multiple sections through this fossil. Ignore the little donut circle, that's just an artifact of doing this work. But you'll see that little shadow at the top of the image. That's a density contrast, and it's picking up the cartilage of the jaw. Occasionally it stops and we've got some labels. Okay? So as it proceeds, you'll see the shapes just sort of materialize mystically from the depths of time. Right? <laughs> Look at it. It's real subtle, but you can see them. They're kind of coming through, and it's, I think we're about here in the block right now. And we're kind of working our way to the front. And you'll see a few more bits and pieces. The cartilage is the lower jaw. 
Cloud Quadra is upper jaw, and then there's some bits and pieces happening in the middle. So we can take all of those individual slices, those little x-ray slices, and then in a computer environment, we can merge all of those shadows, right, and make a model. This is the model that we came up with. Color coded, the upper jaw is green, the lower jaw is in blue, and an extension off the lower jaw cartilage is in red, called this medial or uh, cartilage that comes in. And the way it works is the, this big spiral, which we have in the fossil as well, is completely contained and supported by the lower jaw, and it's located in the middle. What? Right. So it's located in the middle, and it's held on both sides by that red bit of cartilage on the left and right side, and it braces it. I have a model right here. This is a 3D print of exactly that, just scaled down. And so here's my lower jaw, and here's my whoop, little spiral of stuff, and it's held in there, in the midline. And here's my upper jaw with a cup, okay? So that when my jaw closes, there's a little cup to receive those teeth. Right? There happens to be a little stopper, a little bump here on the upper jaw that keeps it from going too far, because if it goes too far, what happens? You don't have a species anymore. Right. That's kind of a one-time mistake. So the cool thing is when you 3D print these, now you can make a mechanical model of it. You can attach some motors, and you can interrogate what the anatomy can function like. Right. So I'm gonna, this is a real simple animation. My animal is looking off to the left. This one is looking at you, which is kind of creepy looking. Um, now, I've color-coded all the teeth. Only those teeth that are colored are really doing the work. Okay? So imagine, imagine your hand, just for say, imagine your hand is inside this shark's mouth as it's closing. Keep your eye on like the green tooth. Watch the green tooth and the path that that green tooth is going to take through your hand. Ow. Right? Okay, let's do that again. Oh, what do you notice? It's not puncturing. It doesn't come straight up and puncture you. It sweeps past. It is behaving like a circular saw, except it's not a free spinning saw, right? Because the jaw joint is close to the surface, and the surface is a curve of a series of teeth, there's a natural drawback of about 30 degrees slice. Each tooth, about 15 tooth, are going to hit your hand and each of them is going to do their own slicing damage. I love it. <laughs> you might not. Okay, the teeth, people have recognized since the dawn of time when they started collecting these, that all those little teeth that you see on that, that spiral, they don't tend to be broken. I mean, they might be broken as fossils because they're rocks and they're fragile, but we don't see any evidence that they were broken or abraded during the life of the animal. And that's why you saw these ideas of maybe it's outside the mouth and not being used to chew. In fact, the original, the Russian fellow who named Helicoprion thought there's no way this thing is chewing with it because I never see any wear pattern damage. So, what do we do with that knowledge? This is what the teeth look like. They are double serrated steak knives. They are sharp. This is actually, I can cut myself on this animal and 275 million years later it can injure me which is cool. Um, they are steak knives. What do steak knives do? They cut meat, right? This is a meat cutter. But if it doesn't have any damage or wear, perhaps it's eating meat without any bone attached to it, right? So probably not eating bulky fish. Maybe it's a calamari specialist. It's a squid eater. That's what we think, especially at younger ages. This is how we reconstruct its head based on what we have. We have the lower jaw, we have the upper jaw, and everything else is creativity. <laughs> I'm going to show you, uh, we were featured in River Monsters a few years ago, and they made this, this is the, uh, this is the lovely video, Imagine You're in the Sea. Life is fine, you're a squid. Uh oh, not good. Careful little squid. Let's <laughs> away. They're looking hungry. Oh, no. They have dead eyes. <laughs> Here they come. Oh! Get away! Oh, oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Ah! <laughs> oh. This is where the blood and ink was like spraying around in the final cut of this version. <laughs> it's good. It's good. I love it. <laughs> 
So that's how we think it functioned in open and closed, but you're probably asking yourself, but Leif, why is there this spiral of teeth and how does that come to be? What I know about sharks, and probably you know about sharks, is that they make teeth constantly throughout their life, and they throw them away when they're done using them, and, and pull it out of your leg after it's bitten you, right? That's normal. This is not normal. What they do is they make teeth constantly throughout their life at the back of the mouth, and they move a conveyor belt of those teeth along a, a root. But they can't shed their teeth, so they have a space problem. So instead of just drawing it out infinitely forward, they have it on a curve. And so as they're adding new teeth, the curve, the conveyor belt gets pushed forward and then eventually down into the lower jaw and gets wrapped over by the next set of teeth, by the next set of teeth, and that can happen four times by the time this animal is full grown adult. 125, 130 teeth is typical for the full grown one and a half foot diameter like the one you could see downstairs, right? Weird. There is no other animal that we are aware of that has committed to keeping its teeth and enveloping them only to keep those baby teeth and just lock them away in the lower jaw never to be used again. Only the top 15 are actually functional. What? <laughs> so then we can take that one foot, one and a half foot spiral. We, can imagine, we know how big the lower jaw is because it's exactly the same size as that spiral. We add a head to it, because presumably it has a brain, right? Maybe it has a snoot. Okay, so now we get multiplied by two, two and a half times. And then we are making a pretty good assumption, a safe assumption, that this is a top predator, so it's going to swim pretty quick. Most predatory top swimming fish tend to have the, the torpedo-shaped body. And so there's a head to body length ratio, six to one, eight to one, somewhere in there. So that is a multiplier. If I know how big big head is, I can multiply it out to get to the body length. So we're in a conservative 30-foot shark. That's a big shark. Uh, how big is a white shark today? 12 feet, maybe 15 feet if you're really big. So this is twice that, right? Big, 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 big. It'll make your day. Fat is the largest predator that is alive at this time that had ever evolved up until this time period, 275 million years ago. And the cool thing is, they were swimming right outside this window. Right? They're right here. And they're still here, but we have to dig them out of the ground. And we have all sorts of tricks and tools to try to understand these animals that don't want to preserve very well, right? But there are uh, always clues that we can key into. And I'm hopeful one day a miner is going to contact me and say, Leaf, I found a spiral, and there's the tail. And we've got the whole thing in the ground. It's going to happen someday. <laughs> right? I hope. So. I've got room for questions, lots of questions I bet you have. If you want to learn more about this critter, come up the road a couple hours. We have the largest now. We have 95, almost 100 of these specimens because the miners know I want them, so we get two a year. <laughs> um, you can read about it, there's a book about it. And uh, there's a river monster episode that features this animal, has that little video in it, and it's, it's pretty well done. So, questions. Surely have, there must be questions. I have a question here. This is a fishing joke. I'm over here, sir. Oh, there you go. If these things were still alive, would you ever go fishing for them and hunt them as says, trophies? Oh. What kind of tackle would you use? <laughs> Any kind of tackle, man, to be honest. Uh, like like piano wire, piano wire, and a squid. You'd probably get some. <laughs> probably something like that, man. <laughs> Question. Do you think these can be found in glaciers? Ooh, could you find them in glaciers? Probably not any glaciers that are around today, simply because our oldest glaciers aren't nearly this old. So uh, the evidence that we have in the rocks is that these animals go extinct about 270 million years ago, quite a long time ago, and nothing in the rock record after them. In fact, they're a one-off. They're not a one-off. They're a dead-end lineage. There's no animal that comes after this that, that it gave rise to, so to speak. It was kind of did its thing, was pretty successful for eight million years, and then it's kind of, it's, it's end of the tree ends. Yeah. Good question. Oh. Have you found, have you found the jawbone remnants in any other samples of the fossil? Once we clued in to what it can look like, about one in 12 specimens has it. So I've got uh, about four or five more specimens that are really obnoxiously large and too big, actually, to stuff into a CAT scanner at the moment. I'm hoping to find a CAT scanner that I can st st stick some of these in. 
because it, it is um, it's more common than we previously thought, but it is still relatively rare. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, last question. Do you have a, a hypothesis as to why it was more adapted to store the teeth than to shed them? So, a question often comes up, how do you get this animal, right? There must have been an animal or a series of animals that gave rise to it, right? And we have an animal that is from the previous time period, the Pennsylvanian time period, a little older, and it's an animal that makes a conveyor belt of teeth, similarly, and it looks like it's on a common root, can't shed them, but it never makes a full loop. It actually has an open spiral. And so, um, it, it doesn't, this animal doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? It had to have some predecessor. And I think the fundamental rule, if you will, to getting to this animal is this idea of always making new teeth, but having to stash them. And the best way to store something that you have to keep growing is spirals. We see snails do that and ammonites do that. This this kind of a common feature of having spiral growth to uh, account for continuous growth. So I think that kind of gets to it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I was just going to ask. Uh, I know some of the relatives, like the Edestus, I think. Is yeah. That look like the, the zipper kind of scissor mouth. Like, have we had any luck getting uh, cartilage on those? Edestus is a favorite. So Edestus is the scissor-toothed shark. So it has a, a banana shape in the top and lower jaw. So banana here, banana here, full of teeth. They can shed their teeth. When they shed them, it looks like a little taco shell that comes out with a tooth at the end. Okay, so they've got two of these things. I just described it a couple of years ago because we have a whole juvenile skull about this big with banana, banana, right? And it doesn't cut like this, like you would think, like scissors. It actually comes short and then pulls back. And so it goes, chomp, slice, you're dead. <laughs> chomp, slice, you're dead. And it smiles. Uh, they're found in Chicago. They're found in Chicago and they lived in bayous. It's a bayou shark. Really cool animals. Yeah. Uh, can I have two questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you ever work with marine biologists? And if it lived long enough, would, if the teeth kept growing, would it eventually kill it? Ooh. Okay, one, I do work with marine biologists. Part of the team that helped make this sort of, uh, I don't know, discovery, make the understanding that we have about it, and, and also work out the function and how, what bite force it could have. We're, we were working with people who work on modern sharks, so we were definitely working with marine biologists in that case. Uh, two, could it grow so big that it would kill itself just by virtue of growing too big? I don't think so. Um, there, there does seem to be like a max size. We've come into like um, the, the biggest teeth from root to tooth top are about this big, right? Which is, that's, that's good. Um, <laughs> but the biggest full spiral where we have the whole thing recorded are like ones that are downstairs um, where the teeth are only this big. Right? So we know they got about this big, and, and I don't know, all animals, I suppose, have a maximum age, maximum size that they can grow to. Um, it's, it's more likely old age than anything else that's going to end things. I, yeah, I think they can just keep adding new ones. They can keep adding new ones and the system works. Yeah? Yes, do you use ground penetrating radar to find fossils, and could you combine the latest in AI to help increase the results? Oh, I love that question. Okay, ground penetrating radar, can we use that to image down under to, to identify fossils? I think in a particularly, like, if, I can imagine scenarios where that could happen, where it could be effective. We've never personally used it and, and been able to, like, really resolve a bone or something like that in a subsurface. Second question was, just a second. Uh, could you combine that with the latest in AI? AI. AI is going to revolutionize how we start identifying and recognizing the differences between species because you can ask the question to an AI uh, that has seen all bones that have ever existed, right? And ask, what does it most resemble? And it should be able to come back with a few options, right? I think that tool is going to be developed in the next five years. I guarantee it, actually. <laughs> I know people working on it. Yes. Uh, what do you think led to the extinction of the shark? Great question. How did these things go extinct? The greatest mass extinction in, in animal history happens 250 million years ago. My animal lived 275 million years ago and went extinct well before that mass extinction event. 
but it lived in that, at that bay, especially uh, in the, that I pointed out on that map. It loved cold water because cold water fed uh, nutrient-rich waters that fed the squid that are the animals that it's eating. And I suspect, hypothesis, I don't really have like a full backing on this yet, but I suspect something undermined the uh, food web for this top predator. We see that like, if you are the top dog and you need a lot of food to make a big body, you're very vulnerable if your food sources get diminished in any small way. Right? The first ones to go are the big furnaces. And they, they, don't, they don't last forever. But they did have an 8 million year run. So, pretty good. Pretty good. Other questions? We got a mic just rolling around. Um, yeah. Why does it appear to me like as the teeth go down the conveyor belt, they look smaller? Is that just, uh, am I seeing things? Yeah, so it, it, you have to think about it backwards, right? Of course, um, the littlest teeth are in the middle, and the biggest teeth are on the back. And the little teeth are what the animal had when it was a small little fry, cute little guy that probably wouldn't hurt you. And then by the time you get to the outer part of the spiral, those are the most recent adult teeth. So when you're looking at the spiral of 125 teeth, you see every tooth the animal ever made. The whole life history is there in that one fossil. And the outer ones are the last ones to be made before it died. There you go. Um, okay. Is the STL for that 3D print available online? Ah. And if you were to look at the histology, like Dr. Lamb talked about, mm -hmm. would there be the different lines in the teeth? Like, is that something that's been looked at? We have looked for lines. Other people have done thin section work through to see if there's any lines, and my understanding is there's not. We've also looked at the chemistry of teeth, like uh, tooth 1, tooth 10, tooth 20. Does the chemistry change in any way that we can use that? to tell somehow environment changed and then use that to tell how old my animal is, right? So far we haven't been able to uh, get the chemistry to work for us. I think it's been overprinted. Uh, the STL for this, let's see. If you contacted me, we'd provide it for you. <laughs> yeah, it's public. Yeah. Do, uh, do you have any fossils of juvenile sharks, of the, the younger ones without the, the spiral where they're yeah. just starting out? Okay, so tooth number one is a little fishhook looking thing with a little bump of a tooth. That is what it has when it was a baby. And, all, and the really good ones preserve that middle part and so you have that. Um, the smallest individual helicoprion spiral that I have that, uh, that, that I guess died when it was young, if that's the way to say it, we can tell because we had the last tooth it made. It's only about this big and it only made about 70 teeth at that point. Right? Those last couple loops is when it really just, because it's an exponential growth function, it gets really big fast later on. Um, but no, now, one of the miners told me uh, that when he was out uh, doing, doing his job, he remembers seeing a wall of helicoprion of little ones. And I said, you, you took a picture of it, right? No. <laughs> and so that got wiped off and it's somewhere in the cornfields of Iowa. So, <laughs> Oh, well, it got away. <laughs> yes? Uh, do you have an estimate for the generation of teeth and can age individuals based off how many teeth they have? We cannot age the animal based on the number of teeth, except to say, relatively speaking, more teeth, older animal. That's, that's it. Um, like I was saying before, if we, could, if we could get a good chemical signal off of all of those teeth, and perhaps the chemistry changes in a, in a repeated kind of way over time. You could use that to then maybe make an inference about seasonality and get time as a component of two. I believe, this is a hypothesis, I believe that the animal when it's young is making a lot more teeth per year than it is making when it's getting older and bigger. Just by virtue of every tooth that it makes, it has to keep growing its body length to keep because the jaw has to keep getting bigger. So um, it's probably the growth rate of teeth decreases over time as it gets older, but actually putting a number on it, we can't do yet. Someday. All right, I think we'll have to cut off the, the questions now. Let's thank Dr. Kevin.